Good evening and welcome to Navarro Live. I'm Aaron Bastani. Tonight I'm joined by an unexpected co-host, the GOAT, Michael Walker. Michael, how are you? I am very well. Pleasure to be joining you on a Friday evening on the other side of the on the other side of the camera. Well, not in the studio. I'm co-hosting. I can't think of a more poetic way to say that than than than, than just saying it straight out. Maybe I'm not thinking straight today, Aaron. I hope the show goes okay. Yeah, maybe you're uh, you're discombobulated because we're uh, messing with the schedule here at Navarra Media. Also, I want to make an observation here, Michael. Last night you were wearing a shirt. Are we now seeing a new Michael Walker with a very different set of sartorial choices? We'll find out in the coming months. On this evening's show, we'll be discussing strikes, Alistair Campbell going nuclear on Newsnight, and Ash Sarkar dropping some truth bombs on BBC Question Time. The new figures predict that net migration, that's the number of people who arrive in the UK, minus the number of people who leave, could have been nearly a million in 2022. Now, these are just projections. We won't get the official stats from the Home Office until later in the month, and they're from the right-wing Centre for Policy Studies. That's a think tank. This telegraph graphic uses ONS figures, and as you can see, net migration remains steady broadly between 2012 and 2020. It hovers at around a quarter of a million. Then there's a dip during the first phase of the pandemic, but last year it began to spike. The Centre for Policy Studies estimates the total for net migration in the year ending December 2022 will be anywhere between 675,000 and a million. Data from the Home Office shows that around 1.3 million, quote, non-temporary visas were issued in 2022. And this is another graph from the Telegraph showing the kinds of visas issued. Super informative. The majority are the pink part of the column, and they were given to people who want to study in the UK and their dependents, i.e. partners, children, wives, husbands. There were 630,000 of them in total. Then a further 415,000 visas were issued to workers and their dependents. That's the blue part. And that's up significantly on previous years. And finally, the grey part. Uh, you can see that at the top. That's some 200,000 visas which were issued to Ukrainian refugees and a further 60,000 to people from Hong Kong. That small red part right at the top represents visas granted for family reasons. It was a 2019 Tory manifesto pledge to bring down net migration. And according to The Telegraph, these figures have the government spooked. Sir so John Hayes is a former minister and chairs the Common Sense Group of Backbench MPs. He told The Telegraph this. Population growth at this level is unsustainable. The government needs to act immediately and radically to curb migration. We should not be adding to the numbers of people we take into the country outside of the key shortage occupations. It risks damaging productivity by maintaining or even creating a labour-intensive economy rather than a high-tech, high-skilled economy. It displaces investment in skilling Britons and automation. According to the Financial Times, the government is already formulating a plan to respond to these numbers. They've only been in charge for 13 years. Of course, it's not them, Gov. We can see here from the FT, ministers are now finalising plans to tackle one recent boom area for legal migration. The number of dependents who come to Britain with overseas master's students, often from India and Nigeria. Students have been one of the main drivers of the post-coronavirus pandemic surge in migration, as that data showed from the Telegraph a moment ago, with almost half a million study visas issued by the UK authorities in 2022, a rise of 81% compared with 2019. 81% is a huge increase, but some of that might be explained by EU students requiring visas to study in the UK. So that's to make a lot more sense when you think about it in those terms, after the withdrawal agreement came into effect at the end of 2020. The article goes on to report this. Students, especially those coming from Nigeria and India, have become more likely to bring family with them. With 135,788 visas granted dependents in 2022, up from a little over 16,000 in 2019. The Department for Education, the Home Office and the Treasury are finalising a plan that would stop dependents from travelling with master's students on one-year courses, according to several officials close to the discussions. One said, many of these courses only last for nine months. We don't think this will have a big impact on our ability to attract global talent. 
One minister confirmed the focus was on the dependence of master's students, saying it's clear we have to do something. We're a long way from David Cameron's promise to reduce annual net migration to the tens of thousands. And finally, the FT has this detail about agreement in government on the matter, writing this. The Treasury, which normally favours higher migration, has accepted the political need to restrict the number of dependents of overseas students, while Gillian Keegan, Education Secretary, has also agreed the plan. Not the uh, economic need, the political need. It's an interesting use of words there. In response to these figures, Labour leader Keir Starmer said this. I think we need to wait and see what those figures are, but I've seen that speculation. So he's responding to the official Home Office data that comes out at the end of the month. I think if we're anywhere near that figure, uh, 675,000 to a million, then it will show the government has completely lost control. We need a managed approach and we haven't got that. Like almost everything else under this government, there's no plan, there's no control. And just like everything else, it seems like the system is broken. Britain's migration system is broken because we're not processing asylum claims. We are exiting international agreements because we are receiving a relatively small number of asylum seekers and having a collective freak out. So, I mean, to me, that's where the asylum, well, the migration system in general is, is clearly broken, is in that asylum section. I mean, if you look at where these, you know, what type of migrants these are, if a lot of it's students, I mean, presumably that's just people keeping our universities afloat, right? So the idea that this is going to be the cause of low productivity instead of the fact that we have a sort of industrial system whereby no one is incentivized to invest stuff, where the government refuses to invest anything, but we have this sort of political and economic culture where you constantly have to make efficiency savings, which means doing stuff as cheaply as possible instead of doing it well. Um, so for the Jacob rees Mogs of the world, what we want to be doing is competing with much poorer countries by making our workers cheaper, instead of saying, actually, why don't we try and compete with Germany, and the United States, by sort of properly um, investing in our economy. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, we were talking about this before, weren't we, Aaron, about whether it will be a politically salient issue, because obviously, when numbers were much lower than this, um, it, it, it became a huge issue. You know, all of these Polish people coming from the EU, um, which again, obviously, I mean, I lived in a place that had loads of Polish people arrive in, in, in Leighton. Lots of sort of outer boroughs of London had huge Polish populations. I thought it made the community richer. But obviously, lots of people were annoyed about that. One of the reasons we probably um, did Brexit. But I think that was because it was, it was very visible migration. Whereas this, I mean, if this is, these are people from everywhere, they're moving to mainly big cities, I would imagine, if, they're, if so many of them are students. And therefore, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that this increase in migration is going to be particularly perceptible. And then hopefully that means there won't be um, the kind of backlash that we saw with EU migration. But I mean, it's, it's, it's striking. It feels like this number has kind of come out of nowhere. Um, and now people are deciding how to politically weaponize it, essentially. Yeah, the, the million figure. Um, and by the way, I, I think this is really important. That um, projection, which came out from a, a right wing think tank, uh, is 997,000. I think this is going to be really important because people will say a million, then there'll be more than a million, then they'll say the millions. The projection is 675,000 to just short of a million. Still historically large. And of course, last year, or the, or the year before rather, these figures, we saw net migration of half a million, something of a record. So clearly we're in unprecedented territory. And like you say, Michael, it's fascinating that these numbers are much higher uh, partly because, of course, we're no longer in the EU, so the people that need visas will be much higher. But they're much higher than what we saw 10, 15 years ago, and yet the political overhead for now seems much lower. You know, ahead of the uh, local elections, Ipsos polled the general public about issues that matter to them. And I think the top four were uh, electricity and sort of gas bills, inflation. I think they generally mean food inflation, because, of course, that applies to energy bills too. Uh, generally cost of living. And I think of the four, the only one which you could call kind of culture wars issues, which is not a culture war issue, was migration, which was fourth. But, but given the numbers here, I think that's, I think that's pretty extraordinary. Um, this claim that you made, Michael, that that's partly because this is generally being driven by people who are coming to study here, as well as their dependents. That means they generally go to places with universities. That generally means cities which are obviously more favorable electorally when it comes to voters who don't really mind immigration. Do you think that's a major factor here? Because obviously there was one of these talking points ahead of Brexit and the Brexit vote and after the Brexit vote, it should be said, is people said, well, actually, the people that have the less migration, they tend to be the, the most 
sort of averse to immigration. I think that's only half the story because there were places like, for instance, Boston, which, yes, had relatively low levels of migration compared to London or, or Manchester, they're far from multicultural, but they were places which saw the biggest shift in terms of migration between, say, 2000 and 2016, particularly 2004 to 2016, particularly from, you know, Central Eastern European migration. So there was actually a material explanation for what was going on. You seem to have a hypothesis here, which is this is a different kind of immigration broadly speaking, or at least a big part of it is, and that that's going to have very different electoral consequences. I think there is going to be an attempt by sort of these right-wing think tanks and by the Telegraph and the Daily Mail to make this a, a really, really live issue. But those areas where immigration was most salient and sort of where the parties were really pitching themselves to when it came to being tough on migration were those places where you might have had, you know, EU migrants move to if, if, if they are competing in sort of lowish wage sectors, often not the bottom, but often sort of lowish wage sectors. Um, and now if you've got people that yeah, go into the universities, they'll be in cities. And I mean, in terms of the hypothesis sort of you put forward um, about the existing rates of change being what's important, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, because obviously I live in East London, no one would, you know, how would anyone know what migration <laughs> levels are in East London? Because we're all very used to living in a very multicultural place. There is no possibility that any one community could even, you know, I often think this is fear-mongering anyway when people say, oh, it's completely changed the community. But it wouldn't even be fear-mongering. It would just be impossible. You, you, people would, someone would just laugh in your face. You say, all of these people are coming here and changing the high street. It's like the high street is already, you know, you, you, you've got no idea where people are coming from. And that's great. That's why I love living here. Um, but you can see why it's easier to sort of politically mobilize people in a place which was historically quite mono-ethnic and then suddenly becomes a lot more diverse. I mean, it might not always be about race as well or nationality um and, and yeah i think that was key with, with brexit and i mean it's very early to say but i, I would i would imagine if we were seeing numbers this high and it was in the same patterns that we saw when it was eu migration from eastern europe then this might be a more live political issue than it currently is net legal migration to the uk in 2022 could have been as high as one million and yet the government likes the public to focus on what it calls quote illegal migration what they mean of course is perfectly legal asylum seeking in 2022, just 45,000 people arrived by small boats. But the government will use words like invasion and criminals to conjure up a threat and stoke anxiety. That's the Tory strategy because they think it's a vote winner. Here's Navarra Media's very own Ash Sarkar tackling exactly that question on BBC's Question Time last night. I want to talk a bit more about what this bill does. What this bill does is that it will treat anybody who comes here but on a small boat, which includes people from Syria, from Afghanistan, from Libya, from Sudan, from Eritrea, it will treat all of those people blanketly as criminals. So people who have been raped, people who have been tortured, people who are fleeing persecution. What the bill also does is that it removes protections for pregnant women. The current limit in place is that they can only be detained for 72 hours. It will remove those limits. So some of those victims of persecution and war and rape who are pregnant, who find themselves in this country at last, it should be a safe haven, could find themselves facing the prospect of giving birth in what is effectively a glorified camp or prison. And that's not who we are as a country. That's not the best we can do for people who are fleeing the Taliban or who are fleeing Syrian prisons or who are fleeing persecution in Iran. And that's why I object so strongly when you, when, when you use these words like generosity to talk about things like having a glorified prison ship or refurbishing a prison just around the corner from here in order to detain people who are fleeing some of the most unimaginable circumstances possible. No government does that because they think it's morally good. No government does that because they think it's particularly efficient or effective. You're doing it because you've committed yourself to this nastiness Olympics because you want a pat on the back from the Daily Mail. And the human no. cost of no. that is obscene. No, it's not true. It's not true. One of many rounds of applause for Ash last night. Labour's Thangham Debonair was on the panel too. This is what she had to say about the bill. We have people who are in hotels or barges or wherever at the expense of the British taxpayer costing nearly £6 million every single day, not because of the boats, but because of the backlogs. And this bill will just make that backlog even bigger because we will no longer be able... Won't, if people arrive 
from Khartoum or from, from, the, from Sudan or from Ukraine if they don't have their documents, or Afghanistan if they haven't been able to find a safe and legal route to, to, to this country. If they're coming to join a relative here and they don't have the right documents, they will be deemed not only illegal now but forever, but we won't be able to send them back. So they will simply be stuck in limbo. Now, that's not good for anyone. Whatever side of the debate you're on, nobody wants people to have to cross this channel in, in small boats. It's dangerous and it's illegal so, and it's wrong. However, we have to have a better way of dealing with this crisis, dealing with the backlog, tackling the criminal gangs, admitting that the Rwanda experiment has gone horribly wrong because that's it's obviously not working and it's not deterring anybody, and dealing with the problem upstream by making safe and legal routes actually work. So Labour say they don't like the bill, but would they repeal it? Keir Starmer has already said he wouldn't. Let's see what Debonair had to say. Should this illegal migration bill pass before the next general election, would Labour repeal it? I'm assuming they would, given well, your Well, we, we voted against it. We tried to amend it. We oppose it so vehemently. Would, would you repeal we it? We will have, after 14 years of Tory governments, a whole list of things we'd like to undo. We will also have a whole long list of things that the people of this okay, country so you're not have asked committing, us to Just to be clear, you're I not committing to repealing it. As shadow leader of the House of Commons, it would be irresponsible for me, as a government minister in waiting, to make a promise about when we will be able to timetable each and every single thing that we want to undo. But we have to undo the part of that law which makes it unworkable for a future okay, Mo Farah to get to this country and actually okay. become a British citizen. And that's what we, where we would start. Shadow Attorney General Emily Thornbury was in a different show this week, ITV's Peston. And in a sign that the Shadow Cabinet isn't entirely unified on this issue, she said this. Clearly it's wrong, it's immoral, and it's not going to work. And would you repeal it? Well, I think we should uh, repeal it. Yes, of course I do. But I mean, we'll see what we'll see what happens. I mean, it's I mean, we have been completely against it. We have voted against it every way. We have tried to amend it. We've tried to make it, you know, better. We've tried to knock the edges off. But I mean, there's so much legislation that we disagree with. Mm. If we spend all our time repealing conservative legislation, we won't be able to put forward our positive agenda. But yeah, I mean, this would be on my list of things to, to, to repeal. I'm Michael, it's clearly a huge issue, and uh, particularly if Labour wants to highlight the government's failures on, on immigration, they're, they're going to need a position of their own. Do, do you think they're trying to be too clever here? I'm starting to think that actually will they repeal it, won't they repeal it, is, is maybe a not quite the right question. Because I, I think when you enter government, you don't want to just have a sort of, we're going to get rid of that, we're going to get rid of this, we're going to get, you know, you, you want a positive platform. So the question should be, will in your migration policy. So I assume, you know, most, most governments when they come into power will have some kind of immigration bill. So, so we can assume that when Labour come into power, they will have some kind of immigration bill. So, so for me, it should be the question of Labour is going to be able to make decisions. You will be able to legislate when it comes to immigration. Are you going to have a system whereby if people arrive here irregularly, they are ruled out from getting asylum? So I, I think they should be asked about the core principles within the bill and say, do you commit that a Labour government will not have a blanket policy of deporting people if they cross the channel, et cetera, et cetera. Do you, you, you as Labour, you say you want safe routes. Where will they be? How will you decide the numbers? I feel in a way this repeal, to, to repeal or not to repeal is maybe a bit of a distraction. I mean, in a way, I, I, we do need to hear some kind of commitment from Keir Starmer because I think the whole problem at the moment is they don't want to fight this election on migration, so they prefer to not commit to anything. And we have seen in the past how it's often the case that you know, the idea that a, a, a party will be too scared to say they're going to make a change before the election, but then afterwards suddenly get incredibly brave and say, oh, no, now we are going to take on the tough um, task of making our migration system a little bit more humane. You know, I, I don't think we should have much faith that Keir Starmer is going to do this well. At the same time, I, I don't quite think to repeal or not to repeal is, is exactly the question that it's most important to be asking. Right now, we're experiencing the largest wave of industrial action in decades. It's often hard to keep up. Some disputes are settled and favour striking workers, others end in compromise or sometimes in outright defeat. But sometimes something happens directly related to a strike, which, while not meaning workers' demands are met, underscores that their efforts are getting somewhere. And that's how we should understand the resignation of this man. His name is Simon Thompson, and he has been the CEO for Royal Mail since 2021. There is an argument to be made that he's Britain's most useless boss. Stiff competition there. The Times reports this. 
Ever since taking the top job in 2021, Thompson has been under pressure over strikes and he's faced criticism from MPs who accused him of not giving, quote, wholly accurate answers when he appeared before them. British understatement there. Thompson, a former Ocado executive who ran the government's much criticized COVID-19 test and trace smartphone app for five months, was the group's fourth boss in less than three years. He had been a non-executive director at the Postal Group since 2017, and one of his roles included responsibility for engagement with the workforce. It goes on to make clear where it all went wrong for Thompson, saying this, one of his priorities as chief executive was to push through an automation revolution at the company, which at the time had 150,000 employees and a history of industrial strife. In July last year, the dispute came to a head with more than 115,000 Royal Mail workers who voted to go on strike. That's the subtext here. Thompson, who earned five times the salary of the Prime Minister, handled change poorly, and as a result, that has cost the Royal Mail hundreds of millions of pounds. In short, 100,000 workers didn't trust the guy, and they wanted him gone. As you can see from this photo, picket lines saw striking posties holding placards with the slogan, Thompson out. So why did these strikes happen? Well, because last year Royal Mail offered, if you don't include performance-related changes, a 2% pay rise, 2%. Meanwhile, inflation is now 10%. So essentially, a millionaire was telling posties on around £25,000 a year to get 8% poorer. In 2021, Thompson earned £753,000, as well as £140,000 in bonuses. Now, that bonus came despite the fact the Royal Mail was investigated by the regulator Ofcom for failing to meet delivery targets. You're being investigated by the regulator. Here, have a bonus. Can you imagine that happening to you at work? I don't even think at Navarro Media would be doing that, and we're very enlightened employers. In response, Thompson uh, might have said he was being rewarded for the company seeing massive profits over the previous few years, but if that's the case, then why isn't it being reflected in any pay offer to workers? In essence, Thompson has taken a company, the Royal Mail, which recorded £1.7 billion in profit in three years, to the brink of losing hundreds of millions in 2023. And personally speaking, I'm shocked, frankly, that company shareholders let him stay for so long. We often talk about trade union strugglers, if it's specifically, do you want this contract or that contract? But this idea that you can have trade unions sort of really determine the personnel and decisions made at the top of the company, you know, it sort of reminds me of, sort of the German system where you have seats on boards for trade unions because they recognize actually that if you involve workers in the decision making in a company, it will make better decisions. One of the reasons is because workers tend to make very long term decisions. They know that they might be in that job for 30 years. They want to make sure this company is is safe and works well um, for decades. A CEO is often going to be in and out like this guy, Simon Thompson, sort of really trying to work towards the incentives of how do I get the biggest bonus in the next six months. Now, that's not always going to be in the best interest of the company, as I mean, it seems like this was a very clear example of where someone had some pretty poor incentives. He's getting huge bonuses while running a company into the ground. I suppose uh, one other thing I think is interesting here is that, you know, they, they sat the guy, right decision. But I think we shouldn't underestimate how difficult a decision that probably was. And the reason I say that is because shareholders, I mean, the right wing media, Tory politicians, what they always want to say is that it's the workers who are being unreasonable. The workers are wrong. The workers are irresponsible. The workers haven't quite understood how the company should work. And I think the sacking of this guy is really an admission by the shareholders that actually, oh, it was our guy that got this wrong. So it's, it's very, very difficult to say that, oh, it was the union who were being unreasonable. If then you decide, well, actually, to be honest, we do need to sack the boss, right? So I think it is an admission of the of the wisdom of trade unions, I suppose, and the wisdom of people who are who are working at the front of, of a company as opposed to the people who are you know, cozying up with the shareholders and making huge bonuses for running a company into the ground. Such a great point. Next time postal workers are on strike and you get some press release from Royal Mail blaming them, they can say, well, you sacked the big dog, the top guy. Uh, so there's an admission of blame going there, and it's certainly not on us. In somewhat related news, today sees as left workers on strike. That's the trade union for train drivers. That will be followed tomorrow by a strike from the RMT. Here's as left General Secretary Mick Whelan speaking this morning to BBC Breakfast. ASLEF has rejected a deal um, that's been offered, a two-year offer, 
Um, so that would see drivers get a backdated pay rise of 4% for 2022 and a 4% increase this year. Uh, the Department for Transport says, and you'll be aware of this, ASLEF has had a fair and reasonable offer that would take the average train driver's salary from 60000 to 65000 by the end of the year. The government's facilitated this very fair and reasonable offer. Why is that statement and that offer at, at such odds with what you've just said? Well, let's call it out for the malicious lies that it is, Dane. It's not a fair offer, it's not a reasonable offer, because the strings attached to it are about ripping up every condition we've gained in the last 140 years and virtually giving up our firstborn. So the reality of this offer is that it's a less than RPI pay offer, massively. So in effect, it's a 20% pay cut for giving up all our terms and conditions. And what? the companies were told, and everybody's been told throughout the process, what our red lines were and what we would not give up. So putting them back into the deal was a deliberate act, a malicious act to scupper the deal. Mick Whelan there explaining why his workers are on strike to the BBC. And here he is talking to GMB about whether the timing of his union strikes were designed to intentionally ruin Eurovision. When you came up with these dates, did you know and were you aware that Eurovision was taking, this, taking place this weekend? When you've come up with the dates for June the 3rd, do you, well, were you even aware that the FA Cup final was taking place that weekend? We're aware that whenever we take any form of action, there's an event or affects somebody's life every day. But the timetable for this was arranged around our reaction to the non-deal that was put on the table. And under the Tory legislation, we have to give 14 days notice. And the first day that we could immediately react to after the insult that we had was today. It wasn't about Eurovision, it was about the first available date. The subsequent dates then are based upon the patterns and the rest day working patterns of our members, trying not to hit the same people on strike days twice. So there's no day where it be Monday, Friday, Saturday or Sunday where there isn't an event in this country. But our, what we do is based around the needs of our members. But what would you say to those people who, you know, they want to get to Eurovision, they want some joy in their lives, they want to get there, it's a very important event. And the FA Cup final, that is two Manchester teams trying to get down to London in June. I mean, what would you say to those people who, who you know, have, have saved money, they've bought their tickets, they want to go, we're in a cost of living crisis and you're spoiling it for them? We're four years into this, four years without a pay rise. The people behind me don't want to be on strike. They don't want to be losing money. They have families. They've got people who want to go to Eurovision. These are the supporters from Manchester who also want to go to that cup final. But strange, isn't it, that nobody kicked up last year when Network Rail crossed the West Coast down to London when there were teams from North West in the final last year. Apparently, if a trade union dare stand up for itself against a government that's interfering in its free collective bargaining, we're the villains. Can you tell me what else we can do? Would you be talking to me this morning if we weren't on strike? Would you be talking about the needs of my members today if we weren't doing what we're doing at this moment in time? We're in a point in time where we have no choice but other to articulate the voice of our members because of the actions of people who employ us. That was very compelling on both counts there from Mick Whelan. And the explanations regarding timing seems really fair. Regarding the claim of no pay rise, ASLEF has rejected the offer of a 4% pay rise, which was made by the 16 private train companies who they are now in dispute with. Given inflation is 10%, that is obviously a pay cut in real terms. Furthermore, ASLEF claim drivers' wages have been eroding since 2019. In other words, they've been getting poorer for four years. And again, that's a claim confirmed by the evidence. Michael, should ASLEF apologise for ruining some people's plans to go to Eurovision. No, we will work it out. I mean, Mick Whelan there is saying that this was a coincidence. It might well be a coincidence. I'm not inside the guy's head. I wasn't in the room. I've got no idea. Even if though they had planned it for the day that they knew the FA Cup final was and they knew Eurovision was, that also wouldn't be a problem, right? Because the whole point of a strike is you want to create a hit to your employer and what's going to be a particularly bad day for your employer for you to go on strike on, one that would have been very profitable for them. So. Obviously, the FA Cup or and Eurovision, that would have been a good day for ticket sales for their employer. Now, they've been treated terribly by their employer, and so they want to do them some harm. So it, it, it seems, you know, logical either way, either if it was the first date they could go on strike or they chose this as a sort of particularly strategic day to go on strike, both perfectly acceptable and perf within the, perfectly within the realms of normal industrial relations. And I was just Googling sort of while you were talking as well, how, how will people get to the, to the FA Cup from Manchester? And apparently both clubs, City and United, are putting on subsidised coaches. You know, people manage. The, the idea that there are loads of people in the country sort of like, well, we were supportive of the trade unions until we had to get a coach instead of a train. No, I mean, 
people are generally united. I imagine people in Manchester are going to be generally it's a fairly left wing city. Liverpool as well as where Eurovision is, isn't it? The and Eurovision's a bunch of young gay people. We love train drivers, you know. Um, am I that young? Young enough to fit in at Eurovision, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think this sort of attempt to divide and rule is just not really working. Mick Whelan, obviously, incredibly articulate when he said that. And on the issue of train strikes, I mean. The smart people I've read with analysis on this, essentially what they are saying, and even sort of centrist analyses, sort of saying how can the government fix this, is they say the big mistake was to combine wage negotiations with terms and conditions. Because when you've got high inflation, wage negotiations are always going to be contentious, right? Because normally, you know, low inflation, maybe you give some people a 1% rise, that's fine. High inflation, people want a, a, an inflation busting pay rise. You might be trying to negotiate them one which is a little bit below inflation. You know, maybe some of your fuel um, costs have increased. So that's already going to be incredibly contentious. And what the companies have decided to do, you know, with the government backing, is to try and use this opportunity to push through um, changes to working practices, which the workers are obviously going to be very much opposed to. And you know, the smart people say if they wanted to resolve this, what they would do is separate these two issues. They could easily make a deal on pay, but they can't give people a real terms pay cut and rip up their terms and conditions and expect anyone not only to reject that offer, but to be incredibly offended and incredibly pissed off at their employer. Also important to say, uh, football fans going to an away match famously don't use coaches or travel the night before. It's just a thought. A female Labour MP has reported a front bench colleague to the Metropolitan Police, claiming he sexually assaulted her. The incident allegedly took place after a summer party in London in July 2021 and was corroborated by two sources who said the woman told them about it shortly afterwards. The website Tortoise reports this. Senior party figures, including at least one other shadow minister, were also made aware of the claim... She, this woman who was allegedly assaulted, was encouraged to make a formal complaint but told Tortoise she felt his popularity within the party would stand against her. As a result, no action was taken and the shadow minister has remained in his post. According to the Mirror, the Met are no longer investigating the case at the request of the alleged victim. But that's not the only story of sleazy and abusive behaviour in the Labour Party. Another one involves a senior advisor to a front bencher who allegedly sexually harassed an intern 20 years his junior. Politico has the story reporting this. The man is alleged to have groped the woman, a former intern, when she was in her early 20s, a complaint which was judged proven twice by parliamentary investigators and separately by the Labour Party. The woman first launched a complaint using the internal process available to parliamentary staff at the time. The complaint was upheld. The man was instructed to write a letter of apology and no further action was taken. She then complained about his conduct to the Labour Party in early 2020. After a year had passed with no outcome, the party informed her they had no record of responding to her complaint and asked her to confirm she wanted to continue. Just extraordinary. The former intern was finally told this month that her complaint had again been upheld and that the man who is more than 20 years older than her and remains an advisor to a member of the shadow front bench would receive a written, quote, final warning. Politico also reports that at least two other women allege sexual harassment by the same man. After that story broke, the aide resigned from his post. The woman who made the allegations told Politico this, Although I'm glad that the member of staff has resigned, I shouldn't have had to spend years pursuing this case, and the party should have taken action first. There are still big questions to answer for the member of the front bench and other senior officials who knew about his behaviour and took no action. Sky News asked Labour leader Keir Starmer for his comment on the story. All of these allegations have to be taken extremely seriously, and they are taken seriously by me and by the party. I do understand from my experience as chief prosecutor how difficult it is for people to come forward. That's among the reasons that we made our process completely independent, so it's not a political process anymore. But what I would say is that I encourage anybody uh, to come forward and to feel that they're supported through that independent process. Just extraordinary, isn't it, Michael? He says it's an independent process. I mean, we know, generally speaking, that Labour complaints process aren't independent. I mean, Keir Starmer's on record as saying that he's personally intervened in things. And then he says that uh, they take it seriously. Well, we have a, an interesting case study here because you have a woman who's basically appealed to two separate authorities, the Houses of Parliament and to the Labour Party. The Houses of Parliament addressed it quickly, efficiently, and the Labour Party, after a year, said, sorry, we lost your complaint. So they, they clearly don't take it that seriously. This speaks to a culture of silence on this stuff in the Labour Party, doesn't it? 
Well, am I correct in thinking so Parliament dealt with it speedily, but then only asked the guy to write a letter of apology? Am I correct in, in, in That's saying correct. that? That's so correct. It's, it's, it's not exactly a particularly sort of impressive record no, but comparing you, the Labour Party to. No, but what you could say is, I think that's right. I think that's, a, that's, that's an important observation to make as well, the, the, the lack of a punitive element here, absolutely. But what you could say in, in terms of what Keir Starmer is saying there is that we take this issue seriously, but we have a direct comparison here, don't we, between the Houses of Parliament, which you might not agree with the conclusion they made. I certainly don't. You don't seem to either by the sounds of it, but at least they addressed it quickly and efficiently. They expedited the matter, which which means they take complaints seriously. Labour say after a year, sorry, we lost your complaint. Do you still want to proceed mm. with it? I mean, that, that doesn't suggest to me they take these kinds of complaints seriously. I suppose it doesn't. I mean, I, I think we know Labour Party disciplinary processes are always going to be a nightmare, whoever's in power. Um, I mean, I think Jeremy Corbyn had a much harder time because he had the whole of the right wing media trying to weaponize those problems. And then people inside the party also trying to completely undermine the process. So it's much harder for that guy. But um, if you've got hundreds of thousands of people in a political party, you know, and it's, you know, it's, it's not a particularly well oiled bureaucracy because it's constantly beset by factual infighting. I mean, I can see why these things just don't really work very well. That's not obviously not an excuse. Um, probably actually, um, why we should spend less time obsessing over what people say on social media and actually spend more time um, talking about what people are physically doing to other people, um, to to my mind. I suppose, uh, I think a big problem here is that this is so much led by what journalists decide to pick up. So when Jeremy Corbyn was leader, obviously um, uh, the disciplinary process was completely tied in knots because anyone who'd ever liked a tweet which could be seen as a trope, suddenly they, you know, th this this was a whole national political crisis um, obviously, I don't think that should have been a priority. I think what should be a priority is people abusing each other. Like, obviously, online matters, but physical is much more important, right? And so maybe if we were a bit more realistic about how much control a party can have about these things, um, then these very important things wouldn't slip through the net. I mean, there are some very gross elements of this story, which means that it is, you know, it's not just a procedural issue. It's a, it's a political one, which is, you know, I, I think one of the alleged victims um, said that she didn't want to report it because she thought the shadow, you know, the, the person who she was complaining about was so popular that it, it wouldn't go anywhere. So there are clearly some political issues there. Um, but I do think the whole way we talk about sort of disciplinary processes and, and political parties has been a bit of a, a mess for a long time now. Just going back to that first story, because there are two independent stories here. I mean, this is really remarkable, Michael. It relates to a female Labour MP who reported a front bench colleague to the police in regards to sexual assault. That is somebody who could be a government minister in, in 12 months. And then they've decided to withdraw uh, the allegation, despite the fact that multiple sources within the party have, have not corroborated it, they weren't there, they didn't see it, but the woman told them about it. I mean, that's, that's a pretty big story, isn't it, Michael? Why do you think that's happened? I mean, do you think that says something about, look, let's not just focus on Labour, because of course, th this stuff happens in the Tories too. I, I, I accept that. But is this, is this emblematic of a broader problem that really in, in, in British politics, if you want to progress as a woman, you just don't speak up about these things? Yeah, no, I think that sounds like a really important point. I mean, obviously, you know, we're not the ideal people to give sort of like really important insight into this question. But I mean, it, it does seem the case that yeah, you you can see here that why would you make a complaint against a powerful person if it's going to be ignored for years, um, and if it's going to be ignored by people who believe it to be true, but say, well, what are you going to do? Um, this guy is pretty important and powerful and popular in other ways, so we're going to overlook that. I mean, we've seen that again and again and again across various institutions where people are are able to get away with being abusive because they're seen as valuable in another sense. So you know, they might top the sexual abuse in the sort of negatives column, but if there's enough things in the in the you know positive column, then they'll get away with it. Oh, you know, it's a, it's a shame they do the sexual harassment, isn't it? But they're such a good public speaker. Obviously, um, it should be the case that if you have a proven case of sexual harassment in the negative column, that should be the end of your career in any organisation. Former New Labour spin doctor Alistair Campbell is widely considered an abrasive character in the media, and his combative style can sometimes push the boundaries of what is acceptable. On Thursday, he appeared on BBC Newsnight alongside former Brexit Party MEP Alex Phillips to discuss, you guessed it, Britain's departure from the EU. 
It's been seven years since that vote. And we're finding that, I mean, in total, actually, about 260,000 EU laws are in UK statute. And they'd found 4,000 down the back of the sofa they wanted to do something about. Yeah, but the laws about, that were passed they're, by they're UK Parliament. Do, well, they were, no, well, they were, but they weren't able to be properly scrutinised. No amendments were able to be... scrutinised at the time. No amendments were able to be made. Those laws were not made by the British people for the British they people. Were. Of course they weren't. I've sat in that Parliament. I was elected to it. Don't try and they pretend were, I don't I'm know telling you, how the EU system I'm works. I'm talking about our Parliament enacts EU law. Of course it does. They are not it EU really laws have passed any, down. It's we're not put into UK statute. I'm not can, actually denying that. But what the, the, the point so of this is... don't say that there are laws the, that have been imposed on us by Brussels. They've been enacted but by there was UK no way as Parliament a member of the EU. There was no way as a member of the EU to reject them. And you know that as well as Your I MPs do. Your MPs here know. could. That's you, what you made know, sovereignty look, here. We're going down a rabbit hole and this is a pointless well, debate. because you all talk so much rubbish when you come on these programmes. Excuse me, that's just unnecessarily rude. But it's true. I'm sorry. You haven't actually let me talk, so if you Carry would on. let me talk, Carry perhaps on. you might I'm, agree with me. Well, let, let, right. let, let her finish, and Sometimes. then I will come back to because you. Because I don't think you're, you know, particularly being a good contributor right now, because you're just being essentially don't rude. make the point. Right. Now, what, what I think a lot of people, when they voted for Brexit, wanted was essentially this country to take its future in its own hands and to make decisions that would benefit our industries, that would make decisions that would benefit our communities, that would actually lift the wages of those who are the lowest paid to actually secure our borders, which is something else that's not been done to actually enable our fishermen to have a self-sustaining industry and actually make a profit from it. None of these things have actually been delivered. None of these things have been delivered Absolutely. because, frankly, we've got a government that treats Brexit like a gimmick and doesn't have any courage or conviction to see it through. And this Rishi Sunak is, is a Brexiteer. Rishi Sunak is a Brexiteer. Is a Brexiteer Boris Johnson... Well, eventually, was well, a Brexiteer. Let's see. Um, and I don't remember seeing Rishi Sunak holding many Corex boards and taking selfies on the campaign trail, so I would actually deny that he might be as much of a Brexiteer as he says he is. But frankly speaking, we're in a situation now where the, the government should be actually relishing the opportunity to take control of various laws and being able to put into place things, like I said, state aid into critical sectors. We're seeing right now AstraZeneca moving to Ireland. Made that point. We're seeing car manufacturing moving to China. OK, we Alistair were Campbell, able, your turn. Will any of these people who fought so hard for Brexit ever face up to their own responsibility and face the fact that what they all promised was a pack of lies, what they all promised was never going to work? None of you, none of you have ever brought forward a plan that says this is Brexit and this is how it works without damaging us here in the UK. And when I say you talk nonsense, when I say you talk nonsense, let me finish. All of those laws that you talked about were enacted by elected British governments and elected British parliaments. The fact that you in Europe couldn't do anything about it underlines that the sovereignty lay here. So all your lies about taking back control, any, more money for the NHS, sovereignty, hold on, immigration, hold on, the hold list on. of it. You uh, have listen, on I knew, I knew you were going to come up with, you know, You're the, the money really for the NHS. Alexander Nothing Phillips. to do with me, not my campaign. And it's very rich, a man who essentially was part of telling lies to invade a country okay, to accuse okay. me of dishonesty. I think you might have lost okay. the argument there, my dear. If I may patronise you even more. Honestly. No, that's it now. Yes, I'm I will. No, I'm that's sorry. It. No, that's they, it. No, that's sorry. It. You, you bring these people on, you never challenge them. You let them talk Please. utter rubbish about Brexit. And it's happened on the BBC for year after year after year. OK. That's I am not going to take that from you with respect, fine, Mr fine. Campbell. Thank well, you. You don't thank, have thank, to. Thank you very much for being on the programme. Thank you. Thank you very much yeah, for coming on for the programme. We were laughing while watching that. It's just ridiculous, isn't it? So English at the end as well. Thank you. Thank you. Could, could Alistair Campbell have said thank you more aggressively at the end? Just bizarre. And look, we played that a clip. It was four minutes long. There's a seven-minute clip uh, on social media, which is itself my longer interview. I'm going to ask you a question. What did you learn from that clip? What did you learn over the last four minutes? What new information did you gain? What insights made you think, oh, actually, that's a really good point. I didn't think that before. Now I do. Or, well, that's challenged my, my common sense about something. It's exactly the kind of punch and duty stuff where the people who support rejoining the EU side with Campbell and hard Brexiteers side with Phillips. Though I have to say, Campbell's conduct certainly wasn't to my taste, particularly towards the end, particularly towards Victoria Derbyshire. I don't think she's been soft on anyone. I think she's one of the better people at the BBC. And Michael, what did you make of Alistair Campbell's, let's call it erratic behaviour? I thought you made Alex Phillips look good. And I mean, she is someone who doesn't have very good arguments. So I mean, I, I presume what they're arguing about is this idea that they should be 
um, repealing all of any kind of EU regulation all at once without really checking it. Now, obviously, that's silly and unnecessary. Repeal them if you want to repeal them, but there's no point in just setting you know, a light to the to the package of regulations, which might have a lot of necessary safety regulations, for example, in them. So the idea that we just put a bonfire to all this red tape, which is sort of language that conservatives use, we know that's a nightmare. We've seen Grenfell. We've seen what happens when you say, oh, red tape is only a bad thing. I don't even want to use the word red tape. My apologies. Health and safety regulations, let's say, even though that's a term that's been demonized by the right wing press as well. So she came on to argue uh, a position which I think is very clearly and very it, it's very easy, actually, I think, to, to make an audience think that's probably not a priority we should have. But Alistair Campbell just goes on high off his own supply, like ego sort of just streaming out of his ears and mouth, sort of saying, and I think basically confirming all of the, the concerns and the fears of people who might have voted for Brexit, which is that instead of having someone here making positive arguments, you've got someone saying you're too stupid to be on this television program which is essentially what Alistair Campbell was saying over and over again. Why am I even having this conversation with you? You're too thick to be here, right? And then to say you've lost the argument once she pointed out that he also has never been held for account for the lies he told, which, by the way, were much more consequential than the lies the Brexiteers told. I mean, how did that lose the argument? Who is his audience? I think one issue here, and I've said, you know, I'm, there's a danger here because obviously I'm a podcast host as well, um, but I do think there, there might be a sense in which Alistair Campbell and what's the other one called? Rory. Rory. Rory Stewart, yeah. the polite Tory. Th them having this sort of successful podcast, which is listened to by their fans, essentially. They say, oh, we just, uh, we're, we're across the political spectrum because I was in Labour and I was in Tory. You're both massive centrists with the same politics and the people who listen to you are massive centrists with the same politics. And they get loads of positive feedback from that. And then Alastair Campbell now thinks he's some sort of political demigod when actually, when he's speaking to an audience which is broader than that, everyone just looks at him and thinks you're an absolute asshole, which is, for me, what happened there. I felt like him kicking off at Victoria Derbyshire at the end. It was just uncalled for. It was kind of weird. I mean, it was at that point I thought, okay, maybe this isn't actually a strategy. He's just, like you say, half his own supply. Inevitably, that news night spat led some on the pro-Brexit right to call for Alistair Campbell's head. Nigel Farage said this. Alistair Campbell is a thug and a bully who showed his true colours last night. He openly lied, saying that the UK Parliament could stop EU law, which is not true. Newsnight should release footage of his behaviour off air, and he should never be allowed back on the BBC again. Meanwhile, Farage's fellow Brexiteer, Martin Daubney, said this. Bully boy Alistair Campbell shows his true colours on BBC Newsnight. That Alex woman, quote, it's very rich, a man who told lies to invade a country to accuse me of dishonesty. Campbell, I think you may have lost the argument there, my dear, if I may patronise you even more. And Alex Phillips herself wrote this on Twitter. What they don't show in the Newsnight clip is the way he blasphemes loudly and leans his body across me in an aggressive way before huffing and puffing and snatching at his microphone while the next link is read. It was actually quite frightening. The hairs on my neck stood up. Because we're always scrupulously fair here on Navarro Live, it's important to show the responses in support of Campbell. It did exist. Here is one from the anti-Brexit Twitter account, Brexit Shambles. Alex Cambridge Analytica Phillips finding out the hard way what passes for facts on GB News doesn't cut it in the real world. There were others too, saying Campbell dropped some much-needed truth bombs on Phillips. And whatever you think of the guy, we can all agree that has to be better than actual bombs being dropped on Iraqis. And Michael, did Alexandra Phillips say anything which was untrue in that segment? In the clip that we've just seen, I'm struggling to think of anything she said that was particularly untrue. I mean, there was this quite esoteric argument, wasn't there, between Alistair Campbell and Alex Phillips, where he's saying there was no loss of sovereignty within the EU because any law that was passed in the EU, it, it was MPs who wrote that into UK law, which is technically true, but I do think it is a little bit of a misleading distraction. I mean, I think people who wanted to remain in the EU, and I think probably that would have made sense to remain in the EU, you do need to accept that by becoming part of a multilateral organisation, you are giving up some power within your polity to make your own laws. Now, the argument, though, is that it's worth it, right? <laughs> It's worth it. The, the, the costs are much smaller than the benefits. Obviously, if we could, we'd love to be making all of our own laws and have total access to um, 
free movement if you know if you're me um obviously not everyone wants that but i would like that um i suppose a comparison here would be free movement for us but not for anyone else right so it it, it would be great I mean, if you could remain part of an organization with all of these benefits and not have any of the costs um but we can't right so i feel like alistair campbell was being disingenuous there yes obviously being a part of the eu did reduce some of our ability to make our own laws i personally think it was worth it but to pretend that it didn't involve that sort of concession when it came to having power seems a little bit odd. I mean, I suppose he's making the technical point that what the government are trying to repeal was officially written by MPs because it was just putting EU law into national law. But the whole thing just seemed sort of silly. I doubt there were anyone there. I mean, I, I was watching that and sort of like, what, what exactly are they arguing about? And I'm a political journalist. So I, I don't think that probably was particularly informative to, to many people watching. England's private water companies paid out £1.4 billion in dividends to shareholders in 2022. That's more than twice what they paid out in 2021, according to analysis from the Financial Times. But profit isn't the only thing surging in England's water. There's sewage too. Tons of it. Environment agency figures show that in 2022, there were more than 300,000 sewage spills into our lakes, rivers and coastline. That's over 800 spills every single day. Measured consecutively, sewage poured into our waterways for nearly 2 million hours last year. It's vomit-inducing, literally. And rather than upgrading our water infrastructure to address environmental pollution, water companies are pouring our cash into overseas private equity firms and pension funds. On BBC Question Time, Tory Minister for Social Care Helen Waitley told the audience what the government was doing about it. We have been taking action. In fact, already since, 200, since 2015, £141 million worth of fines have been paid by the water companies. So they are already being penalised for when there, uh, there, there is pollution is in the outflow. Yeah. We have introduced tougher fines already, building on that in legislation. We are making the water companies yeah. invest to fix this problem. Over the next 25 years, they're going to be investing the order of £56 billion pounds upgrade the water infrastructure. Yeah. Do you, does the government have time a view? And money. We are determined to get them to fix it. We are taking really tough action, really tough action, but it does take time. And does the government have a view, when you say it will take time, mm. when that might be? Well, I just said, I mean, over the next 25 years, 50 years. Years. <laughs> well, it years. They can't 50, wait 25 years to go for a swim. <laughs> she wants to go in tomorrow. What's happened to this young lady? The, the number I said was 56 billion pounds over that period, it cannot be done simply overnight as simply okay. as that. These problems are hard to fix. We're politicians. We can't do anything. By the time they want to solve this problem, uh, Michael Walker will become Michael Zimmer frame. According to LBC's Nick Ferrari, it isn't that difficult. I can solve this at a stroke and let me tell you how we do it. The water company bosses are paid an average of around £1 million a year. Between the 22 or 23 of them, they bank £25 million. The profits that they make are eye-watering. Mm -hmm. The fines that are levied by the government are almost built into the business model. Mm -hmm. They don't actually care because they're making so much money. Meanwhile, people in Bexhill and Eastbourne are out there swimming in a word I won't even use and you can't water your hydrangeas. This is the way we solve it and it's very simple. When the government wants to, they can bring in a law overnight, like the Public Order Act, which saw six people with a load of banners and some rubber bands arrested and thrown in jail. This is the law that needs to come in. Any chief executive who continually allows his or her company to put raw sewage into the water, let's get this law enacted straight away, will go to jail for five years for corporate... <laughs> Because, because, and one of my sons suffered from this, you can get Viles disease, fortunately he lived, which is a killer, and they are playing with people's lives by putting sewage in the water, put them behind bars, it'll be solved overnight. Okay. Lock them up. As a famous orange man once said, who doesn't love the idea of jailing gravy train executives? I know I certainly do. But it was down to Navarra Media's own Ash Sarkar to provide the careful structural analysis that we really love her for. Privatised water companies paid out £1.4 billion in shareholder dividends last year. And 20% of And that's of your... analysis by the Financial Times. And that's, that's not that's from analysis the from the FT. And 
20% of your water bill is going towards shareholder profits and managing the debt for those privatised companies. Does that seem like a good use of your money? No. Do you feel you're getting good value for your money? No. Would you rather that money was going into fixing the infrastructure? Yes. While, they, while these companies remain in private hands, there's no incentive for them to do it. There is simply no incentive. So Southern Water is mostly owned by an Australian investment firm and it's partially owned by the American mega bank, JP Morgan. So your water bills are going towards making foreign corporations rich and because they are so fabulously rich, they can just eat up whatever fine the government decides to levy them with. And while it would be very satisfying to see some of these CEOs in jail, and I would love it personally, <laughs> what I fear is that the incentive hasn't gone away, which is you underinvest in the infrastructure, you let it crumble because, you know, you don't live there. You live in Manhattan or somewhere gorgeous. You don't have to worry about the sea in Bexhill. And instead, the incentive is to extract money from the system that could go towards fixing infrastructure, and you put it towards shareholder dividends. It makes financial sense at this point to bring this industry back into state control so all of the money can go towards fixing the problems. And of course, the Tories don't really want to do that. They only nationalise things at the last possible minute, as they have with the Trans Pennine Express. But what confuses me is that Labour aren't committing to it either, when it would save so much public money. And it would mean that these problems would get fixed because you guys would be democratically accountable. You're not in Australia. You're not in Wall Street. You're right here where we can see you. So in response, what did Labour's Thangam Debonair have to say to Ash's excellent suggestion? It's too expensive. According to her, the costs of nationalising the water companies would be astronomical. But researchers at the University of Greenwich put the cost at around £14.7 billion. That's less than 2% of the government's total tax receipts for last year. And for context, after water was privatised in the early 1990s, dividends to shareholders of parent companies amounted to £57 billion between 1991 and 2019. £57 billion. That could have paid for improvements to infrastructure and Cheaper bills, heaven forbid. Michael, politicians tell people to buy a house, to buy an asset, that it's always worth investing in the future. Why don't they think the same logic applies to them and the state? Yeah, it's pretty ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, I was, I was thinking about this analysis um, earlier today, sort of trying, trying to ponder um, what the right analogy is. And I suppose, you know, in the private sector or just any, any, any ordinary individual, if you borrow 300 grand to buy a house that costs 300 grand, you're not actually any poorer, right? Because your asset is worth 300 grand. What you've borrowed is 300 grand. You're not, you're not in debt, really. You're in debt to the bank. But if you wanted, you could just sell the house and pay it back, right? So you're not um, insolvent, let's say. Now, the only way that borrowing money to buy something would make you insolvent, buying an asset which has an income stream would make you insolvent, is if that asset was not worth very much, it was going to go out of business. Now, we all have quite a lot of interest in this country, in the water system, not going out of business. We are always going to need water. So I think the chances that the government has to borrow some money from the financial markets to buy the water companies and then finds, oh my God, the income stream has dried up. I mean, so long as we need water, there is going to be an income stream when it comes to providing water. And if, 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 if it turns out that you buy the water system and then the whole thing goes bust and collapses, well, we've got bigger fish to fry than some debt to pay back because we're all going to, I mean, starve, right? There wouldn't be any water coming out of our taps. So, so water, the water system is a safe investment because it needs to be a goddamn safe investment because otherwise we're all dead. And also there's this response from some people on the right who just, they're, they're, look, it's not a left-wing thing to say that water at this point should be publicly owned or, or the rail or, or, or Royal Mail. It's not a left-wing thing, right? And, and also, we, we know this in polling. A majority of Conservative voters think that water and Royal Mail should be in public ownership. Majority of Conservative voters, okay? Not majority of the public, Conservative voters. Uh, and what really does grind my gears, Michael, is politicians saying, I've got no power. But what are we voting for then? Why bother to be in politics? I've got no power. I think the opposite is the case, actually. I don't think they want power. I think it's far better if you're a politician to say, oh no, water's failing. It's far better to be in the private sector because then nobody's going to scrutinize the government over it. Oh no, the trains don't run on time. Blame Southern Rail rather than the Minister for Transport and the government of the day. It really suits them well because they're paid the same. They still get the ministerial cars. They still get the status. They still get the pension. They have wonderful lives, but they don't control anything. And when you ask them to sort problems out, they say, we can't do anything. We can't do very much, sorry. 
complete nonsense. I have to say, probably the first in my life as well, I've agreed with Nick Ferrari. Maybe Ash worked her magic in the green room. Uh, Michael, that's all for this evening. It was really good talking to you from the other side of the camera. Uh, a pleasure joining you this evening. And thanks to everyone watching us tonight. I uh, hope you have a wonderful weekend. For now, you've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.